Civil servants are to be investigated for insider dealings. The government opts to buy the American AWACS, not Nimrod. Drug addicts will get free needles to reduce AIDS. The wife who survived having her throat cut. A doctor is jailed for child porn offences. Good evening. A major inquiry has been launched into allegations that civil servants may be using inside knowledge to make big profits from share deals. Senior inspectors moved in today to investigate claims that government staff may be involved in insider dealing. The team will investigate three organizations, the Department of Trade, the Monopolies Commission, and the Office of Fair Trading. It's the latest in a series of scandals that have affected the city. The Department of Trade's determined efforts to root out insider dealing have sent shockwaves through the city. But that the inspectors will now turn up on the department's own doorstep shows how widespread abuses of privileged information could be. Here at the Monopolies and Merger Commission, civil servants have access to highly sensitive information about companies involved in takeovers and mergers. The sort of thing the inspectors will examine is this. Say a major American company with energy interests decides to take over a British company heavily involved in the same business. At that stage, shares in the British company are trading at one pound each. The Department of Trade and Industry can decide to refer that bid to the Monopolies Commission to see whether the resulting company would be so powerful it could undermine proper competition. Any civil servant who knows for certain that the Monopolies Commission and the Trade Secretary will give the go-ahead to the takeover could buy shares in the British company at one pound each. Once the announcement's out, the shares are bound to climb, say to one pound fifty, giving them an instant 50% profit. That's insider dealing and it's illegal. The inquiry into the affairs of Guinness in this country and the revelations about self-confessed insider dealer Ivan Bosky in the United States have renewed the political debate about whether the city can effectively police itself. Clearly we do need a public agency which would be independent both of the city and of government, would be charged with making sure that the law was observed in the money markets and in the people, by the people in the government who control the money markets. Uh, what it illustrates is the government's determination forever it has reason to believe that there may be insider trading is taking, using the powers available to it and taking quick and ready action. There's wry amusement in the city that the Department of Trade is now in the limelight, but it's also bracing itself for further revelations. Mark Webster, News at 10, The City. The Nimrod project is cancelled. After 10 years and a billion pounds spent on the GEC plan to provide a British-built early warning radar plane for the Royal Air Force, the Defence Secretary, Mr Younger, told MPs Nimrod was found wanting. He also said the government made mistakes over the project and there'll be an internal Ministry of Defence inquiry to ensure better monitoring of big contracts in future. Britain's early warning plane will now come from America. Six Boeing AWACS will start arriving in 1991. Labour says it's a sad, bad decision that will cost jobs. The Alliance says the story shows serious deficiencies inside the Ministry of Defence, that the government had no option. Given the fact that this was the biggest defence contract in years and that nearly a billion pounds worth of taxpayers' money has been lost as a result of it all, the House has not been getting very excited. Conservative MPs did cheer on Mr Younger in the debate tonight, but Labour attacks on the government's decision didn't really strike home. Judging by the relaxed mood afterwards, the government's decision in Cabinet this morning wasn't a particularly difficult one after the pretty devastating dossier on Nimrod built up in the Ministry of Defence. Mrs Thatcher, of course, had prepared the ground by telling the House on Tuesday that the country's defence needs would come first, but that still didn't stop the Shadow Defence Secretary attacking the government's decision today. The Secretary of State's decision is not only sad, it is a bad decision. It is a bad decision for Britain's defence interests because ultimately a country can only defend itself on the basis of the strength of its industrial and technological base. Mr Younger's handling of the announcement effectively silenced the Tory backers of Nimrod, but the opposition touched a raw nerve when they taunted Mr Younger with his suggestion earlier this month that Nimrod worked as well as AWACS. Of course it does on occasions reach some parts of the of the uh, of the criterion at some times but uh, could i suggest that if one is up in an airborne early warning aircraft in a time of war liable to be shot at by an enemy one does require the equipment to work all the time and not just occasionally for gc's chairman mr pryor it's been a fairly awful day with mr younger's remarks only coming a salt in the wound didn't he accept though that in the end it all had to rest with mr younger's judgment about nimrod 
that's his judgment. And at the end of the day, that is the decision the government has reached. And I have to accept that decision. I'm bitterly and deeply disappointed by the decision that's been reached. And I happen to believe it's the wrong decision. The main decision over, MPs aren't going to let the matter rest entirely. There's the question of all that wasted public money under a succession of defence secretaries. The opposition, I think, have got a difficulty because they entered into the contract, and the contract is the problem, because it's a contract with outbreak clauses, cost plus contract, uh, no effective monitoring, no discipline built into it, and so we were really caught. With well, two replies to that. First, it was done in 1977, and the government has had seven years in that time to rectify it. Secondly, when the proposal was made, there was no voice raised in objection in the House at all. Nine hundred million pounds of taxpayers' money has been involved in it, and I think uh, we're entitled to know what has happened since 1977 and why did we end up uh, with something that um, is, is uh, literally money down the drain. The Ministry of Defence has already admitted that this whole episode over Nimrod is one of the worst examples of contract mismanagement. And the powerful Commons Public Accounts Committee has already started an in-depth investigation into what went on. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. It'll be over four years before these Boeing AWACS radar planes are decked out in RAF markings, though the Defence Ministry might consider leasing US Air Force planes before then. Six of them will cost the British taxpayers £860 million. Another two may be ordered later. Continuing the contract to complete the 11 Nimrods would have cost just 200 million less, according to the Defence Secretary, with no guarantee they could be finished satisfactorily. Mr Younger says Nimrod's radar lacks range. It picks up false targets over the sea. It can't track targets for long enough and has too little computer power. GEC accept these problems exist, but say they can cure them. They promise to pay a penalty of 200 million pounds if they didn't manage to. The company's risk, though, was just a financial one. The risk that they couldn't take, though, is the risk that faces me. The risk of finding in three years' time that it didn't work for whatever reason, and that the RAF faced a blank period of X years thereafter, with no airborne early warning and a threat to deal with. Now, that's my risk, and that's the risk that I feel is more than I can ask the RAF or the defence of this country to accept. For the past 15 years, the RAF has been using these old Shackleton planes for airborne early warning. Its technology is 1950s and not up to detecting the present generation of low-flying fighters and cruise missiles. In 1977, the Shackleton's replacement program began. The RAF had 12 spare Nimrods. Developing a radar for them was seen as cheaper and quicker than joining other NATO countries in buying the American AWACS. 1982, Nimrod should have been ready. NATO received its first AWACS then, but Nimrod's radar was late. It was 1984 when the first Nimrod was delivered, but its radar was unsatisfactory. In February 1985, however, the RAF said the system would work. But by the end of last year, things looked bleaker. In March this year, GEC were given a final six months. Today, it was cancelled after almost 10 years and nearly a billion pounds. GEC have said such a decision would cause 2,500 staff to lose their jobs. At the factories concerned in Hertfordshire, GEC employees were bitter. I didn't think Maggie could do it. I really didn't. There's so much despondency, it's terrible. I'm absolutely appalled by it. It's, you know, I'm ashamed to be British sometimes. And what about the 11 Nimrod aircraft converted to the radar role? The RAF won't want to scrap them completely. 37 other Nimrods are used for submarine tracking and electronic eavesdropping. The RAF will now be looking for ways to use their 11 spare aircraft. Rolls-Royce Aero Engines is to be sold off in April or May next year, but the Industry Secretary, Mr Channon, says the government will keep a special share in the firm to make sure it stays under British control. The privatisation could raise more than a thousand million pounds. The government is to give drug addicts free needles to reduce the risk of catching AIDS from shared needles. The health secretary, Mr Fowler, is setting up 12 pilot schemes around the country. Although the areas haven't been chosen yet, the authorities in Liverpool have been operating a similar scheme for two months. It's units like this which could soon be commonplace all over Britain. Advice centres for drug users giving confidential counselling regardless of whether or not they're registered addicts and offering a new service for those who inject. Have you got any used works? 
put some there. Or do you want to put them in the, uh, in the used bowl? needles yeah. are exchanged yeah. for new ones? Liverpool was the only health authority in the country to introduce the service two months ago. Originally, the government didn't want to offer free needles for fear of appearing to condone drug abuse. But today, that was set aside. Shared needles is one of the most deadly ways in which the AIDS virus is spread. It is one of the ways in which it goes into the general population, and we are having devastating results at the moment, with, of course, babies being born with AIDS. So the whole purpose uh, is to get counselling, advice, guidance to people who are misusing drugs. In Edinburgh, where over half of the city's drug users are carriers of the AIDS virus, medical officials have been campaigning for free needles for the past year. They say the government's action is tragically late, and Liverpool is also critical. I can understand people's anxiety about it, but when you consider how dangerous AIDS is, I think it's quite scandalous that it's taken this long to actually start these schemes. It's taken this long for this government to do anything about it. The first new services will start in the new year, but councillors fear it could take months, if not years, to win the confidence of unregistered addicts reluctant to go to a drug centre. Andrew Simmons, News at 10, Liverpool. The Russians say they'll end their ban on nuclear tests in the new year if the Americans continue testing. The Russians claim there have been 24 underground tests in the United States since they imposed their own ban 16 months ago. They say the first American test next year will signal the end of their moratorium. Serious rioting has broken out in a regional capital of the Soviet Union and the authorities have taken the unusual step of reporting it on television. Residents of Alma-Ata, the capital of Kazakhstan, rioted after their local party leader was ousted by Moscow and replaced by a Russian. Din Muhammad Kuniev had held his post for 22 years. He was a close associate of former Soviet leader Mr Brezhnev. On tonight's evening news, Soviet television didn't mention Kuniev's dismissal. The newsreader just gave an account of the violence. Сложившейся ситуации воспользовались хулиганствующие, паразитические и другие антиобщественные лица, допустив противоправные действия в отношении представителей правопорядка, а также учинив поджоги продовольственного магазина, личных автомобилей, оскорбительные действия против граждан города. Прошедшие собрания на завод... Here, a top children's doctor from a South London hospital has been jailed for a year for running a child pornography ring. He'd been taking indecent photographs of children, as well as buying and selling them. When police raided his hospital office, they found thousands of photographs and hundreds of sex magazines in his filing cabinets. In passing sentence, the judge, Mr Justice McCowan, told Professor Brooke, you pose a grave danger to children. Society must be protected from people who peddle this dangerous filth. Professor Brooke, who's 45 and the father of four children, was the former head of paediatric medicine at a major London hospital. His colleagues describe him as the top man in his field in Britain. When police raided his office in the hospital, they found a hoard of pornography in the bottom of a filing cabinet, which contained the medical records of children under his care. It included more than 3,000 photographs of children in various sexual poses and his own personal collection of child pornography, which contained more than 100 explicit photographs. He advertises material in girly magazines. But the court heard there was never any question that Professor Brooks allowed his perverted sexual interest to interfere with his work as a paediatrician. His career was now in ruins. I am absolutely delighted that our number one priority has been achieved in, uh, in attacking child pornography. But that is also tinged with a degree of sadness, as you say, that uh, society as a whole has perhaps lost uh, an asset of the, the man's uh, expertise. In sentencing him to 12 months, the judge said he accepted Professor Brooke was selling child pornography to fund his addiction and not for greed. David Chater, News at 10, at Kingston Crown Court. A doctor has been jailed for life for murdering his first wife and trying to kill his second. She survived having her throat cut to tell the tale, a report in part two. Also, the winter looks like halting the search for more victims of the Moors' murders and an award for the brave girl who protected her brother from the terrorists. That's in a couple of minutes. Right opposite this cinema. 
KP Lower Fat Crisps. Oh, look forward, Abbott. It's our commercial. Yes, yes, Brother John. Sit down. Crisps that are now free of all colorings and preservatives. It's good, isn't it? Yes, it is. But will you sit down? And they contain 30% less fat than ordinary crisps. Did you hear that, Father? We know about less of the fat. How about less of the chat? Young man, will you kindly sit down? KP Lower Fat Crisps. All of the taste, less of the fat. Road tests on the Canon SureShot Supreme revealed everything to be fully automatic. Take a test drive at your local dealer. Thanks to some intelligent listening, one of the big four banks has come up with some imaginative ideas. Like putting banks into schools to help teach children the financial facts of life. Like introducing a savings account with a cash machine card and then providing access to the country's biggest network of 24-hour cash machines. Not by spending a lot of money, but by cooperating with a competitor. Which of the big four is it? Well, it's the same bank that came out with free banking a full year before the others and welcomed half a million new customers as a result. It's known as the Listening Bank, and you probably know who that is already. Dixon's unbeatable Christmas deals. This superb Seisho portable stereo, great value at under £30. Save £120 on the Minolta 7000 camera outfit with autofocus zoom lens. Save £30 on this Yamaha stereo keyboard with synthesizer plus free headphones. Save £44 on this Canon Type Star electronic typewriter. Dixon's deals, we guarantee you can't buy better. Can you tell me why you shop at QuickSave? Because the prices are right. In fact, I think the prices are unbeatable. There's well-known brands and a good variety. Famous names like KP, the number one nibble. At this time of year, there's a lot of nibbling to be done. And at QuickSave prices, you can afford to always have some handy. After all, you never know when the nibbles will strike. The family doctor has been jailed for life for murdering his first wife with an injection of morphine, then trying to kill his second wife by slitting her throat. Dr John Baksh, killed to marry his second wife, then wanted her dead to claim a quarter of a million pounds in life insurance. The judge said he should serve at least 20 years and said he was demonstrably a danger to those close to him. Madhu Baksh says it's a miracle she survived the throat wound inflicted by her husband. They married in 1984, and within two years, the seemingly loving John Baksh was plotting her death. Three days before their second anniversary, he drugged her with morphine at their home in Bromley, took her to a local beauty spot, slit her throat, and left her to die. She was found by a naturalist checking a toad colony at midnight. That and the freezing cold, which slowed down bleeding, saved her life. As Madhu recovered, still unable to speak, John Baksh tried to persuade her to cover up for him. He says, who was it? You. That was. Couldn't feel, feel it like that. And he straight away, he broke up sort of thing. And he started, he was looking straight in my eyes, and I was looking straight in his eyes. And he started to say, don't say that, Madhu. Don't say that. He was speaking in Hindi now. Um, if you say that, I'll go to jail. You have to save my life. Save my life. Please, Madhu, save my life. But she told police the truth and John Bach's secret. He poisoned his first wife, Ruby, in Spain so he'd be free to marry Madhu. When he told me about that, I was frightened to death. And it was a very big decision to make whether I go ahead with the marriage or not. Once I made the decision, after that, never I suspected him. I thought he was so sorry, so ashamed, so repentful, which he was. He said he has asked forgiveness from God which he has been given, that's why he's not been caught. All that he wants, forgiveness from me, whom he loves, I forgave him. If the first murder was for love, the attempted second was for money to claim a huge insurance policy on Madhu's life. I knew the premium was very high. I came to know about it. 
because once I was reading the statement of the bank, and I saw just to the Hambro life, we were paying 1,000 pound per month of premium. So I asked John, John, can we afford it? It's too much, isn't it? Do we need it? Can we afford it? He said, it's very important. We must have it. I said, OK. And what about your life now? What do you do from now on? I think I'm going to be very, very sad for the rest of my life. I can smile in spite of it. I do not know how. But internally, I'm broken down to pieces, absolute pieces. Snowstorms forced police to call off their search for two victims of the Moors' murderers today, and they think they may now have to give up for the winter. The Pennine winter closed in late this afternoon. The road at the centre of the new Moors' murders inquiry kept open only by the efforts of the snowploughs. For the police and their sniffer dogs searching for 20-year-old graves, a difficult task now almost impossible. The decision to reopen the investigation in winter has been fiercely criticised by MPs. Criticism angrily rejected by the man in charge. Are we now going to be, as police officers, troubled about whether I should take on an inquiry because of what a politician's going to say about it? I don't ever want that to be. Should it ever be, I really want to be in the police force, quite frankly. But a few hours later, Chief Superintendent Topping's sniffer dogs were forced to give up, unable to detect a scent in the snow. The weather will now decide when the search, boosted by Myra Hindley's return to the moors 48 hours ago, will be resumed. This is the weather the police were hoping would stay away until they had a chance to evaluate Myra Hindley's information. Now they know it could be next spring before they have a chance to follow up their new leads. Paul Davis, News at 10, Saddleworth Moor. Unemployment's fallen for the fourth month running. In November, 3,216,767 people claim benefit. That's down more than 20,000. The seasonally adjusted total and best guide to the underlying trend also fell to just under 3,146,000. Vacancies rose for the tenth month running and standard over 215,000. In Scotland, 800 new jobs have been created by a special community venture. This report from Michael Green. Until three years ago, this was a community dying on its feet. With no more jobs in the mines, many brighter children left the area. Others joined the street corner culture of the unemployed. Oil rigs sheltering in the fourth because of North Sea cutbacks add to the sense of decline. Unusually, church leaders provided the spur for change. The Reverend Dane Sherrard got together a management team which was virtually to halve the 40% male unemployment rate. The start was modest. Converting a church needed money, for which, in the end, they turned to the Manpower Services Commission. The MSC, in turn, asked the church to find training places with nearby firms for 50 youngsters, which it did so quickly that the MSC pushed for more. The Manpower Services Commission came back to us and said, now is the time we'd like to help you do something to create your centre. We'll give you a 116-place community programme, provided you fill all the places within a week. So it was down to the job centre, recruiting all of the people that we could find, and started work. Having started work, everything just blossomed. The agency the church set up now employs more than 800 on some very ambitious projects. Converting a church into a theatre is an asset, though for the young to gain experience alongside craftsmen is prized more highly. More ambitious still, restoring the harbour, once a busy fishing port, now silted up with the spoil from the mines. Rebuilt, it should help the town attract tourists. The agency's own transport ferries the old and disabled to enjoy the comfort of a restored building nicknamed Hypothermia Hall. In buildings bought for peppercorn sums, skilled trades like this are shaping up to become commercial concerns. Upholsterer James Boyd knows the social benefit. An ex-prisoner jailed for assault, he couldn't communicate at first, now he's teaching others. Critics will argue that all this is no compensation for the decline in traditional manufacturing but that 800 have found real jobs through this project is undoubtedly impressive. It's a transformation which, say, the job creation experts should give hope and inspiration to other areas of high unemployment. Michael Green, News at 10, Buckhaven. Mr. Eugene Hausenfuss, the American who was shot down flying guns to the Contra rebels in Nicaragua and who was freed yesterday, flew back to the United States tonight. He's expected to be questioned by Congress about the Iran arms deal. Eugene Hassenfuss will become...